Summit Live. And what an absolute amazing conference we're here at. Like the atmosphere is absolutely electric. And we now have a very fantastic guest that I'm so happy to be able to introduce. Please welcome Michael Armbrust, distinguished engineer. And I'm going to try and get this right, uh, <laughs> as in uh, Apache Spark, Spark SQL first contributor and Structured streaming. Structured streaming. Thank you. Yeah. I knew it. I knew it all along. Yes. Uh, and don't so forget Delta Lake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Apache Spark has been on quite a journey, and we've now got the next evolution of that this week. Do you want to tell us about it? Yeah. yeah. So this is going to be announced tomorrow officially in the keynote, but we can give a little bit of preview for it today. We're really excited to announce the open sourcing of declarative pipelines. Amazing. Declarative Pipelines changes the way that people write programs that work with ETL. Before, you had to sit down and you had to write these procedural Spark programs that would step through every single step, including things like retries and parallelism and error handling. And with Declarative Pipelines, instead, you just say, what should happen? And the system figures out how to make it true. OK, so I'm not as clever as you. So I think I'm going to ask you to explain it maybe a little bit easier so that I can understand it. Um, my understanding is that a lot of what you're doing with Spark at the moment is you, yeah, you are saying kind of like, here are the things that you need to do, but there's a lot of detail involved in that, isn't there? So especially when it comes to things like, what do I want my partitions to do? Where do I want them to go? What kind of join do I want? Are you saying that these are the kind of things that are going to be a lot simpler now? With That's exactly right. And okay. I think if you look at it kind of through the history of Spark, when we first started Spark, it was RDDs which were functional, and they yes. abstracted away dealing yep. with thousands of machines. But still, you had to think in terms of map and reduce, which wasn't terribly natural. Mm. The first step towards declarative was making Spark SQL, yes. where now, instead of having to think about map and reduce, you could say things like compute an average, do a join, and the system would figure out how to do it. But that's only making the query itself declarative, and there's still all this glue code that has to go around oh, it I see. to create okay. the table and run the stream and restart the stream when it fails. Right. And so this brings us back to, with a single SQL, SQL query, you can have an end-to-end -end declarative pipeline that takes care of all of that. I'm glad that you mentioned, actually, because in the back of my head, I was thinking, oh, I'm pretty sure that Spark is kind of declarative at the moment if I'm not using RDDs. But you know, contextualizing it with the point of the glue code that kind of goes with it, making that easier for people. Could you talk a little bit more about kind of examples of glue code that yeah. work better with declarative pipelines now? No, absolutely. So, you know, one really good example is when you're doing change data capture. So you've got yep. a stream of records coming in from some other system and you want to apply them to a delta table. Yep. The merge command is declarative for doing one part of it, for taking a row and doing an upsert into that table. Okay. But it doesn't handle what happens if there's multiple records for the same key. How do you order them? What happens oh. if multiple records arrive in different micro batches? How do you remember which version is stored in the table? How how do you handle deletes? How do you handle tombstones? And so declarative pipelines up levels it. Uh -huh. This feature called auto CDC, where you just say, I want to do change data capture. This is my source. This is my destination. This is my primary key. Mm -hmm. and the system figures out the rest. OK, then. So I know some people have already been working with this a little bit. And again, it's part of the open source program. So who are the people who are working with this? What do they like about it? What, what are they telling you about it? Yeah, so you know, this idea of declarative pipeline started inside of Databricks. It was formerly called Delta Live Tables. Mm -hmm. and we've had thousands of customers have success with it. I think what's really cool about it is we've enabled either people who are already sophisticated data engineers to focus on what really gets value for the business, but also people who are just SQL analysts. They're experts in their domain, but they're not experts at distributed programming and error handling and all of these other things. And so this turns them into first-class data engineers. Mm. And so we've got all of these great examples of people where they say, you know, I'm a SQL expert, but now I'm able to build 100-table declarative pipelines that operate efficiently yeah. and reliably. And then yeah. I just got one question. Yeah. So like, yeah. so like uh, a lot of people are using Spark to, do, uh, to just do batch ETL, but is this only for batch, or can you do streaming with it as well? That's a great question. Yeah. So it is it's both batch and streaming. And really, the way I like to think about it is it's about being incremental. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people hear streaming, and they think, oh, that must be expensive and complicated. And yeah. terrifying. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's one of the really cool things about the way DLT extends, or Declarative Pipelines extends the ability to be incremental, is we've got both streaming and materialized views, which prioritize either throughput and performance, or expressivity and correctness. And you can kind of choose what works best for any given problem. Mm -hmm. And you always have this ability, kind of the unique ability of Spark Structured Streaming was always the ability to tune cost and latency. Streaming doesn't have to mean there's a cluster that you're paying for 24-7 giving you the absolute lowest latency. Sometimes it means once a day, 
you process the data and you move on. And the, right. the important thing here is it's only processing the new data. It's not processing everything from scratch every single time you start it. That's a big benefit because um, a lot of uh, a lot of times when people are first starting out building like data warehouses, they end up just recalculating the entire table every time they run it. That's exactly Whereas right. Whereas this sounds like it wouldn't do that. Yeah. So. And one of the really cool things, structured streaming always gave you this ability to make things incremental, but going back and forth between continuous execution or triggered execution required you to, again, change a whole bunch of that glue code, how things are going to run. Mm -hmm. Because yes. if you're running in triggered, you want to do one table at a time. When you're running in continuous, you want everything to run in parallel. Now with declarative pipelines, that's just one configuration flag that changes how the pipeline operates. So as you have changing Excellent. business goals, you don't have to rewrite all your code from scratch. OK, then. And so you mentioned earlier that we've had Delta Live tables, which has been previous, but now uh, it's going into open source. So can you tell us, you know, one, what was the drive for that? But then two, how did the conversations happen? How did the community react? You know, tell it, yeah, I'm sure there's a story behind it because open source communities always have a, a vibe, shall we say. Yeah, that's how did right. it go? Tell us. <laughs> well, so, you know, Databricks has a long history, as you mentioned, uh, Spark, Struc uh, Spark SQL, Structured Streaming, Delta, ML Flow, Unity Catalog. We've open sourced many different projects. So yes. Declarative Pipelines is just the latest in the stream of those. And as with all projects, you start by bringing it to the community. You open what's called a Spark Improvement Proposal. Mm -hmm. You talk about what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. In this case, it wasn't kind of a crazy idea. It was something that was already battle tested inside of Databricks. And so the community actually embraced it almost immediately. I think there were no negative votes. Everyone was super excited to see it contributed to the project. Wow, yeah. okay. And so for the last month, we have been a whole bunch of engineers inside of Databricks have been working full time to get it into open source yeah. so that it could be real at this conference. And I, you mentioned materialized views, but is, is that the same thing? So you've got declarative pipelines and materialized views. Is it one and the same? Um, because I think people have been asking for materialized views for a long time inside of Spark. Yeah, so yeah. I think the way I think about it is you know, declarative pipelines are big, complicated, multi-hop, many tables, many materialized views. Materialized views are one interesting tactic for making ETL declarative. It was kind yeah. of the OG way of doing declarative yeah. ETL, mm -hmm. where instead of having to create and populate this table and keep it up to date, you just said create materialized view and the system manages it for you. Right. What declarative pipelines adds to that is the ability to chain together hundreds of materialized views, along with streaming for ingestion and low latency transformations, all into one single unit. Mm -hmm. Without having to orchestrate all those things, um, you know, by yourself, basically. That, that's exactly right. Okay. But you know, I think as you might be hinting at, this technology also underpins our ad hoc materialized views. So when you go into Databricks SQL yes. today and you say create materialized view, what you're really doing under the covers is you're creating a pipeline with one table in it, and you don't need to worry about all of that complexity. Oh, wow. Yeah, there are a few things where I've started using a brand new feature, and then I realize underneath I'm like, hang on a minute, I think I know what this is. How this is working. <laughs> so you mentioned about ETL, and obviously. See, this is a big part of that kind of T part, but that's not the only part of ETL as well. So do you want to talk us a little bit around kind of the either sides and what's going on in Databricks? Yeah, absolutely. So ETL in Databricks is powered by Lakeflow, which is kind of our unified suite for doing everything from ingestion to transformation to orchestration. So starting with ingestion, the first step is you need to get the data into the platform. Yes. And Spark has always been kind of the undisputed leader at working with big data. Yes. So if you've got a problem like I have a thousand JSON files sitting in S3, Spark is a very easy way to do that. But there were all of these other important data sources, things like Workday and Salesforce and SQL Server and Oracle, that they may not be as big as you know, millions of JSON files, but they're equally important to your business. Mm -hmm. And the best way to get the most value from the data intelligence platform is to not just have some of the data, it's to bring all of the data in. And so that's why we created Lakeflow Connect. Lakeflow Connect is no code, point and click ingestion from a wide variety of data sources. So anybody can do it and bring in all of that data that's important to your business. OK, wonderful. So I know there has been some ingestion that's kind of been going on for a while now. Of the recent developments, what are you? have you either seen that you have been most excited for or know us secretly on the roadmap that you are also excited <laughs> for in the future? Well, I think you know what's really exciting is Lakeflow Connect is now GA. And so a bunch of those sources are available and being used in, pipe, by, in production by many of our biggest customers. And I think as we you know, go forward in time, we're going to be adding more and more and more connectors to it. Hmm. So the exact roadmap, I can't get too, uh, too many details, but stay tuned because there's going to be a lot of really cool connectors there. OK, then. And maybe in terms of the mechanics of it. So uh, why why should people use something like Lakeflow Connect other, you know, compared to, you know, other tools are available, obviously. Yeah. 
But having it as part of Databricks, I feel like there are benefits that are that are coming from that. Uh, what would you see for that? Not just performance, obviously. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, first of all, it is actually quite performant. We've been really impressed with the numbers yes. there. <laughs> it's built on Spark and structured streaming and Delta and all these underlying technologies. The thing I think is most exciting is you don't need to set up some extra system. It's, you don't need an extra contract. It brings the data directly into Unity Catalog, where it's discoverable and governed by with all of the other data in your organization. Mm -hmm. And so it really comes down to that unified analytics platform being able yeah. to do all of this in one space without having to cobble a bunch of different tools together that makes it so powerful. And then, of course, coming to the, the final part of Lakeflow orchestration, it's all or both pipelines and Connect are all orchestrated by Databricks Jobs, which is a rock solid production system for doing anything. It is the yeah. unsung hero of Databricks, I must say. Like yeah. it has been a reliable product of ours for what? Seven years, uh, ten, ten years, years fine, ten. <laughs> it, was, it was originally written by Matei. I think really? back in the day, I it, didn't know that. it was called Elastic Spark. <laughs> 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 At least, and I think in the code base, it's still called that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Databricks Jobs has really gone. I think one of the coolest things in its evolution is it's now so much more than Spark. We have people who use it to build models. We use it to uh, update dashboards, to run uh, DBT projects, and even I think Bilal might hint at this tomorrow. You can even run queries on Snowflake. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Sorry, I've never heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> but we really do think that Lakeflow Jobs is the orchestrator for everything. And because it's backed by this rock solid production system with monitoring and observability, you can be confident that all of your data pipelines and everything that you're doing is happening reliably. Yeah, I, I'd say as someone who uses a lot of jobs to and the orchestration piece to set up lots of demos that I'm doing, it is great to see just kind of how configurable it's become. You know, I think once upon a time, it was like, do the job and then do the next job. And then like, it's so much more than that. Like, again, not not just to like, what can you schedule, but in terms of like the looping logic that yeah. you've got now and having something that's much more kind of flexible, being able to check them into GitHub. Yeah. Oh, yeah. chef's kiss, absolutely love it. <laughs> <laughs> when you mentioned scheduling, I think one of the coolest new features in, uh, in jobs is, you know, not just schedules, but also triggers. Oh, schedules are yeah. great yes. when like data arrives every day at 9 a.m. Yeah. But often the world is a lot messier than that. And if you run your job at 9 a.m., but the previous job hasn't completed yet, well, then you're going to be missing data. And if you wait longer for it to arrive, then you have increased latency. Triggers get rid of this problem. Because instead of running on a fixed schedule, you run when your upstream has changes. And the system automatically tracks all of that in Unity Catalog, both for tables that are in Unity Catalog, as well as files that are governed by Unity Catalog. Mm -hmm. And so you can automatically, with low latency and low cost, trigger these just in time. And the nice thing about workflows as well, or, or uh, Lakeflow jobs, is that you know, unless uh, unless it's running something, you're not actually paying for anything, right? That's exactly right. Whereas, whereas uh, you know, traditional orchestrators, like you have to have something up and running all the time. But with, with yeah, Lakeflow with, Jobs was kind of I would like to think of it as our first serverless product. Yeah, you never had to think about it. You just created jobs, schedules, triggers, all of these things, and then it takes care of it for you. Yeah, the trigger space is, is definitely a nice one. Uh, so we do have a little bit of time left. Um, are there any customers that you've been working with or customer stories that you've heard of uh, where they've really kind of like embraced this and really seen the benefits from it? Yeah, so Navy Federal Credit Union is one that we're going to be highlighting in the keynote tomorrow. And basically what they said was they were always struggling with cobbling together a whole bunch of tools to do ingestion and transformation. They had a bunch of you know people who were very good at their domain, but were not experts in Spark programming. And so they were struggling to get their data ready for consumption. And with you know, a combination of Lakeflow Connect and Lakeflow Pipelines, uh, you know, now they're able to turn these people into first-class data engineers that are managing big, complex pipelines with hundreds of tables. Absolutely. Wow. It does seem uh, kind of an unfair thing to ask someone to be like, hey, you're an expert in your domain. Uh, but now you've got to be an expert in Spark. Yeah, well. exactly. Like also learn about race conditions, and tombstones, <laughs> and all of these other problems that okay. you know, even I don't want to think about.